demonstrations, usually it's just smaller demonstrations um, that don't get um, a national press and where we are asked by the organisers of the demonstrations to provide legal observers so as to keep an eye on police behaviour and to ensure that the police um, are accountable for their actions. Um, we have a list of volunteers who provide legal observers. Again, please think about whether or not you would want to be a legal observer and join our list. Just joining our list is no commitment at all. Um, you, all. All that will happen if you join our list is that you'll then get requests from us as to whether or not you would be a legal observer at a certain demonstration. We would provide training in advance and so forth. So do think about volunteering to be a legal observer. And the last announcement that I have to make is it's not all our politics. Occasionally we have classes as well, and our winter classes is coming up on the 5th of December. We have flyers all in front of you. Um, we have map books and things on the Justice Alliance, and it will be at Garden Court Chambers. Um, there is an entry fee because uh, these classes are not just for the case, and we want to have the picture on it as well. And through the website, if you book early, you get a discount on your entry to the 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 entry um, his work in land and Palestinian rights and so forth, that would be familiar to all of you. Um, what I do want to say is this, that this train of foot standards um, was no longer able to continue in practice and announced that um, two or three months, two or three months ago now. And that is a sad casualty of the legal aid part. And what's important to note about that is that it's not casualty of the legal aid cuts that are currently being consulted on that look like they might detonate high quality criminal defence legal aid work. Cook was unable to continue in practice as a result of the years of attrition and the years of cuts to legal aid that we've seen over the last few years, first from the Labour government and now from the coalition government, and then on top of that, the cuts particularly in the, social, uh, the area of social welfare law that came in on the 1st of April in the legal aid conference in the Council of Assembly there. So, if you think times are, going, times are hard for legal aid, and we've already seen strategies as a result of cuts to legal aid, and the have to the chambers and other firms and, and, and chambers that have not managed to continue in legal aid for the last two years, we, 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 that's where we are. We have yet to know how any criminal defence um, set of um, is going to be able to function and provide high quality, separate criminal defence under, uh, under that legal aid rate if the, proposed, if the government's proposal to transform the legal aid um, actually goes through. So the demise of the book, which is very sad indeed, is um, a lesson to the government that they certainly not engage in um, implementing the cuts that they're currently proposing. Um, I should say that the Chambers has been a massive trend for the whole of the over the years. A number of our members um, practice at the Chambers, and I support our president in the head of the Chambers for a number of years, and the staff um, were always very helpful and cooperative with all those staff. We've made a lot of use of um, the Chambers resources, but from the staff have provided um, some help to the Minister this time. They provided our team to do points, which is why we don't have to do points for the sector and so forth. And so, as a society, we are very sad indeed to see the end of this chamber. We do, on the other hand, just Mansfield chamber, the very best of luck. <coughs> and we also congratulate Mike Mansfield not for not taking his lying down, but for rising to the challenge, as it were. And I know I need to see the future. Right at the time, we said, okay, we're now going to start again. We are going to work out how good quality legal aid services can still be delivered. And Mike and a number of people with Mike have set up Mansfield Chambers. They are determined to weather the storm and to come out fighting. And they're determined to do that not for their own careers, although, of course, those are always important to the individual, but because we see a very real threat to policy criminal defence work, and it's people like Mark and the barristers around him, and similar barristers and solicitors who are 
Anyway, I'm still asking, so I haven't really heard what everybody else has said. And what was interesting for me, because I didn't know who they were particularly, I knew what it was, I just started talking, as I was going tonight, they were in a way, about the life of the radical lawyer and what's left for the radical lawyer. Now, what I find is disappointing, not with the whole thing, it's one of the few oases where you can actually find resolution, where you can actually find a source of inspiration. But generally, and it's not just the bar, but generally there is real desperation creeping in. We're not dealing with, you know, a reviving economy, whatever they're telling us, you know, it's all over the north, we know that. We know that for the average person, they're worried about surviving for tomorrow, never mind yesterday, never mind today. And so for the ordinary person, what is going on, you know, uh, in Westminster is, is becoming almost irrelevant, almost irrelevant, because the, the democratic process is, as I put it on many occasions, bankrupt. And there's something very interesting that's happened in Council Magazine, if any of you get Council Magazine, probably some of you do, some of you don't. It's a pretty conservative magazine, but finally they decided to allow us a little bit of a voice, which I thought was quite interesting. And they've, allowed, uh, they've got an article in there written by Liz and myself about the democratic deficit. Now, I don't think a few years ago they would have allowed us, it's an overtly political article with a topic. It's about, it's about human rights, it's about human rights in this country, never mind abroad. And so, when it came to the meeting in September, I'll come back to what the, the substance of the article is about, but what was important in September was to communicate with the audience, I've forgotten how many were there, maybe 200 people who I didn't know, and said, you all want to be lawyers. You're all training to be lawyers. Well, you need to know why you want to be a lawyer. There's no use just doing it as a excuse. Don't think it's going to bring in the, bring in the money anymore. Uh, because it might if you're up the corporate then, but it may not. And anyway, that's not the reason you should be doing it. And I could see in their minds, they were saying, well, you know, what is it you're suggesting we do? And so what I tried to do is to say, of course public funding is, is becoming limited, and the battle still has to be fought, which is being fought by Jose and another organisation, the justice gap and so on, and the save our justice and so on. Lots of campaigns going on. Uh, but in addition to that, you as young lawyers have to appreciate there's a bigger need now. There's a bigger need now than there was when I started, or oh, certainly at, at the, at, over the last 30 years. But the need is really big now. Because the people who are going to suffer, besides the lawyers, and this is the message, but it's really quite difficult to communicate. And I give as many interviews as I can in order to try and get the message over, which one way or another finally does circulate through. But it's actually not about the lawyers. Uh, of course they're involved, but of course I'm affected big, uh, in, in a big way. So, but that, you know, the ordinary person is going to find that there's just no legal aid for things they want to do, whether it's matrimonial or through to, to prison law. And, and it, that is a message which the public have only just begun to recognize how serious it is. Because it's not just the, the, the withdrawal of welfare benefits. It's the withdrawal of your ability to challenge the decision. And, and one, one of the reporters that it was due to come out in the middle of this week, I think it's coming out in the middle of next week, oh, who did a, I did an interview with on legal aid, um, said, well, I want to give you an example of this kind of situation. She hasn't woken up to it herself. She went to a court the very morning of the interview. Did. She said, and there were sort of 3,000 people being done for not failure to pay their counsel. Because they weren't ever no, of course they're not over them, you know, they're not you know, welfare benefits, that, that's certainly outside the zone. She said, you want to know what's going to happen? I said, well, you ask, you know, don't ask me, ask them. I, I can tell you what's going to happen. There's going to be an increase in, and what they want, the government wants not only to pay, but to also ensure that there's really no effective way for the most vulnerable to get any form of redress. And of course, you began, began to pick up on the realities. I said to people ordinarily, I thought, I come through last night, we want to do a thing on his own. I said, don't talk to me, get out there, go to the court, see what's happening. See actually how many cases judges who are now complaining 
as one did a civil judge at the beginning of September. Um, I didn't bring the government to them, I can't talk about that anyway. He sort of desperately remember the name of the case. Anyway, if, if, um, if uh, where, where did I see it? I don't know. The list is going to come out of it. Well, a judge... By rule, was that was the Yes, it, it, was a, uh, it wasn't him, though. It was another... It was a family judge saying, basically, I'm, I'm representing both sides. Because the woman who is petitioning is, lives in Pakistan, doesn't speak much English, she's not here. And the man is here, but he's not represented either. I don't have lawyers presenting the argument. I don't have all the documents in schedule form. I don't have an interpreter. I don't have an expert. And actually, that's really what the case is about. I don't have an expert on Pakistani law. I thought, I, you know, I was here at 7 o'clock this morning. I've had to rummage, and this is what he says in his testament. I had to rummage through my papers to work out, you know, what was going on and how to sort it out. It's taken me all day to do a case that I could have done in 20 minutes. So the judges are beginning, as well as the public, to recognize how it's fighting. And, you know, some judges, like me, they're doing quite excited about it, so that's good. But it's getting the ordinary public on side, the ordinary members of the public. So I was saying to the audience in September, we have to persuade the public, and you, young lawyers, are part of that, you know, momentum to persuade the public. And the areas where you will be able to play a role, and of course they want to know, well, what is it we can do? So I gave them examples of things they can do things we can do, things you are doing. So I'm just going to run through a few of the things they tie up with what I have in my hands here today. Now, I mentioned the article in Council magazine. Some of you may have seen it. Anyway, it was about a people's tribunal. Now, I, I want to mention this because at the end of the talk I gave in September, there was a few of you. Now, it wasn't a few of you saying, oh, I don't know what about, none of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, no, it wasn't that. It was a few students, hungry, desperate, saying, Thank God you came here. Because actually, the message we're getting is, it's all over by the shouting. So why are we here? What are we doing? They needed to know where to go. And they were offering to help me set up, you know. And he said, Man, I just, wait a minute, wait a minute, just get quiet. And then, you know, I'm glad you, you've been sufficiently inspired you want to get out there, that's great. And so they wanted to know what it is they could do. So this essentially giving people targets, giving people the way forward, is, and, and the whole thing does that, very importantly. And one of these, I can't remember if I gave them this example, that's the Lewis Ocean Hospital People's Tribunal example. Now what happened on this, uh, for me, was, I'm well, not quite the way to Damascus, but it was a very spiritual experience because uh, two surgeons approached, approached me who I thought I didn't know, um, but, you know, it's like, I was saying to Michael earlier on, I remember he said that a long way, and you get a little mind as you, the marbles were dropping out in the early days. So I couldn't remember this particular surgeon, Tony O'Sullivan, who was away with a music. And I wondered why he'd come to me with this proposition, and he said, don't you remember? And I said, no. <laughs> and I said, what, what is it? He said, you represented me. I said, oh, then it's probably it was successful. And he said, yes, I got it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. It was some public order thing that he did years ago, protesting about probably the Labour government. I can't remember what it was. And he couldn't remember exactly what he was protesting about, <laughs> other than he knew that if he'd been convicted, he couldn't have carried on and, and become a uh, pediatric surgeon. He, he said, that's the connection. He said, you did that for me, you've got to do it again now. Because what happened, and the brief story you probably know about, is that um, Jeremy Hunt, trying to get his name right, I don't know. <laughs> Jeremy Hunt and the welfare, you know, the, the cut to the NHS, and in particular, what they were doing to Lewisham Hospital, because in the mm. first place they wanted to close it. Yeah. They wanted to close it. And they wanted to close it. It's got nothing to do with Keo and all the stuff he puts on the BBC last night. It's got nothing to do with we have to address the new demands of a new society, had everything to do with the private finance initiative. It had everything to do with the fact that two to three hospitals, the list is on our little group I'm coming to, so we'll get that, um, all to do with uh, hospitals over the boundaries, out of the jurisdiction of Lewisham, essentially, not that constituency. So they, they were locked into a contract, and he set up the contract conditions for these hospitals, 
Actually, it wasn't a bear. You can get it in one. It was a, a Mr. Bear. Mm. And it reminds me of what I was going to introduce in relation to <laughs> the film. I may have to come back to that before we finish, because I do have a few words to say about the film. Mm. It works. Yeah. So, there, there was a situation in which the people of Lewisham said, we're not having this. We're not going to sit down, sit like me, have to stay over We're not going to roll over. We're not going to walk away. And what the surgeons did, and, and it was very courageous for the surgeons, professionals, to say within the hospital, basically, are we going to stay quiet or are we going to rise up? And they said, we're going to rise up. And at the beginning of this year, 22,000 people took to the streets in Lewisham. Again, the citizens of Lewisham and beyond saying this is more than a hospital. This is a communal point for all of us. We depend on this facility. It provides us with a form of welfare we can't get anywhere else. And many of the people who walk to the hospital don't have cars. Can't afford the bus there to go to the other hospitals in the other area. And it got an amazing response of other people supporting. They raised money. And this is interesting because, of course, Judicial review is one of the areas that the government really wants to cut back on. And they want to cut back on judicial review because judicial review challenged their decision. And this one in the end was successful. Only a couple of weeks ago, Lewis said, won hands down. They won hands down. But in the future, you look at what the government wants to do to judicial review. It wants to raise the cost of lodging it, limit the time in which you can do it, Limit the number of the, the sort of people, unless you've got a direct interest, that so wouldn't be Lewisham Council to actually fund the system. The individuals have to be directly concerned before you can even come or have lots of for judicial review. So, and final, you know, hurdle. You'll only get legal aid if you, you get these eighty percent benefit. But of course, what the government hasn't recognised, doesn't want to recognise, is that the vast proportion of the eighty percent that don't get leave actually have achieved a great deal on the way to not getting leave. In other words, confessions are made by parties on the roof. Lawyers are not going to get paid anymore for any of that. So I just in interpose it because actually the Lewisham case is a very interesting one that could be under threat in the future. But the success story of these people were that they were absolutely adamant that the campaign had to go on in tandem. They wanted a people's commission tribunal. And they wanted the JR to go on the same, the official JR to go on, so it was two strong attack on this. And in the summer, it's not the date exactly, but the full report on what we did in the summer is being launched in the House of Lords in two weeks' time. A full report. Now, I chaired it along with um, Baroness Dallarone. So let's see who was there. You can't remember it. Uh, it'll come to me in a fleeting moment. Uh, I'll, I'll just continue. A baronet over there and a very famous author over here. And uh, both of them had strong connections with Lewisham. And, and I knew them both a bit. Warner, Baroness Warner. That's the first name. The other one will come to me in one second. So the writer. Um, anyway. And what they did is they raised money. They were raising money for the JR. It's a form of what I think is going to become extremely important in other areas. And I've seen it beginning to work in other areas. Now, I, I don't want to, you know, in a sense, do the government's job for them because the government, in one sense, we think, great, right, they're finding the money in other ways. But we don't. The, it's the problem that we've all had to face over the pro bono room for the bar. And I originally had to visit one of uh, my people who originally set up the pro bono room for the bar. And we had these discussions at the time. I said, are you really sure you want to do this? Because the government will love it. On the other hand, you know, there are people who suffer, so you can't let that go. But the problem is, you know, once you fill the gap, you know, they want you to go on filling it. And, uh, but the latest way of getting alternative funds to the issue that we feel strongly about, that's the case of Lewisham, is crowdfunding. And Felicity and I know about another example to do with an environmental issue connected to fracking, where again we were going to take on various companies, and there's something on the boil. I'm not going to go into it in great detail because I don't know how much you know, it's going to get out. But that's what we want. I can give it as an illustration. But the, people, the group I'm involved with raised 50,000 <coughs> crowdfunding to pay for actions which, for, for which there would be no legal aid. 
Now, Lucian did the same. They did a lot of crowdfunding, individual donations, and obviously at the end of the day, they had the Lord Mayor, or, um, the Mayor, sorry, the Mayor of uh, Lucian, uh, gave the theatre where we had for one day a People's Tribunal. Now, I've been involved with People's Tribunal uh, uh, on a number of occasions, Palestine being one of them. Uh, the Russia Tribunal on Tribunal uh, uh, on Palestine uh, was on for three years. We had sessions in uh, Barcelona, in London, in Cape Town, New York, and in the United States. And the object of this, uh, that exercise was exactly the same. It was, in fact, to represent citizens, in that case, citizens of Palestine, who found that the United Nations was just not doing the job. The United Nations allowed Israel, more breaches and violations of international law than probably any other nation put together, all the nations put together. And they were just saying they're fed up. Who's going to do something about it? So that's why Bertrand Russell originally had the inspiration to do it over the war in Vietnam. And this was just an inheritance of that original thought that he wanted ordinary people, citizens, tribunals, and conscience. That's what it was. That's what he had in mind. I've done another one on Iran. This time last year, in the Hay, they keep the Iranian citizens raise money to hire the international civil force in the Hay to hold a day, two days after the weekend, of hearings in relation to the violations there, and they called lots of witnesses. The Lewisham to be captured in fact. So we called patients, we called doctors, we called surgeons, we called ordinary people who had actually not necessarily had to use the hospital to say why they thought it was so important. And what I, I thought was moving, just during the time that I sat on the panel watching, uh, I don't know how many hundreds were there, maybe it was just uh, something like 500 people so much. People have come from the north of England saying, we want this, we want to be able to have a voice, because the government of the day had not been listening. The consultation exercises, the paper exercises, they weren't interested in listening to the burgers of, uh, of uh, Liverpool. They'd already made their minds up, they got the plan. So they were saying, you know, and then they explained how the consultation exercise was an option. They explained that this was this is one of the best hospitals in the country. Everybody conceded it was one of the best hospitals. And they said, so why are we being closed? Then they, of course, the government said, oh, well, sorry, they're not going to close you. You won't have access in there. You know, how close is walking? You know. And they said, well, how are we going to work this if you don't have the backup of the food for you? So every time they came up with an argument, the surgeons would come back and say, and the medical staff would come back and say, particularly for the maternity unit, which is going to be mostly at home, and basically, you know, they'd have a, another walk-in facility without the obstetricians in the background. So we did, once we got down to the need to do, complete nonsense starts from. So we held a day in which, for me, the moving moment is watching the audience. And there were people in tears. There were people so moved they couldn't believe we're dealing with the United Kingdom in this same way. People who couldn't believe that being allowed an opportunity to express themselves. That's how bad it's got. That's how oppressive it's got. Uh, I'm not trying to say, you know, we're on a par with many of the nations in the world that we know about, where there's real oppression, usually with tanks and, and bombs and all the rest of it, and, and white phosphorus and that kind of stuff. Of course, they haven't got quite as bad as that, but psychologically, it's almost People are imprisoned in their lives, feeling that they can't speak until they get this opportunity provided by their fellow citizens. So to me, that was uh, you know, an amazing step forward. And that's why in the Council Magazine, I was really gratified that they allowed us the opportunity to explain the meaning of a people's tribunal under the heading of, you know, uh, if you like, making up for the democratic deficit, which is uh, very obvious for most people that the ballot box is not the answer to anything. So, I think that, that inroad back to September provided the younger lawyers to say, we, we need younger lawyers to do this, because what happened in the heavy days of course, is that I just put out an email with input and said, they want me to do this, but I can't do it on my own, it's usually you need a team of people to do it. And what was it, for me again, extraordinarily heartwarming, was that 17 people within 24 hours said others. For nothing. I'll do it for nothing. So, uh, I believe she was one of them. Elizabeth was another one. So, Elizabeth was the coordinator. We've got a whole range of people doing different things. Some people were taking statements from witnesses. Some people were the actual barristers presenting the case. 
and cross-examining. The government were offered an opportunity to come, but guess what it took them to But, you know, they didn't even send a statement. I mean, they all tried to ignore it, just like Israel tried to ignore the lack of tribunal on Palestine until it got really heavy, and then they suddenly woke up to the fact that some of their own MPs were coming and supporting So, these people's tribunal, just, just one frame for the future, that there are people there who really need the opportunity that if the, if the government won't give them an inquiry is going to become less common because of course the government will recognize that inquiry is for them and not good news. Now I'm going to pause here just to wind it back a bit. Sorry, I'm going in the order of um, Just to wind it back a bit to what I was going to say about Phil because uh, and public interest lawyers and so on. You all know his work, and I think the reason why we're particularly proud of Phil is because, you know, like many of us over the years, he is the centre of pretty vitriol comments from time to time. Which, you know, when we get it, and I've had it obviously, it, you recognise you must have done a good job mm -hmm. if you get that kind of response, which you don't get from not only tabloids, but Graham in particular. And, and I thought it, it's a, it's a, a poignant moment today, or it would have been if you could have got here, so Phil is a listen, this is for you. The reason why it's a, a poignant moment today is um, a, a, a couple of things that just occurred to me. Last week, a Marine gets convicted of murder. Mm. So let's just think about it for a moment. Uh, there, there, there's a sort of a, extraordinary calling over this case by politicians, most of them are saying, or some of them are saying, oh, well, some of them are not going to be in Germany, and we're in America. I can just see him saying that in different sort of states. However, this is the man, same time, same week, who is in charge of the government for refusing to disclose something. And I don't know whether you've been following this. And this is back to an inquiry. What's happened? Chilcott. We're four years on down the line since Chilcott began. And that and then he really was the really another war criminal, of course. Well, actually quite a number of them, but one of them, you know, is going around with the Middle Eastern end there. <laughs> my goodness, my goodness. Um, can you believe that? So the government is sitting the cabinet office, of course on the instructions of the government, are sitting on documentation. Documentation is absolutely crucial in terms of Tony Blair. It's about conversations between Bush, Brown and Blair. Their cabinet minutes, their notes to correspond, they run to hundreds of documents. Now, Philcott put on his website, because I think he's fed up. Well, never mind the rest. And we've been expecting this. I think Tony's going to go and get a freedom of information. Because what is going on here? And of course, what a, now he's put it on his website, he's been saying to fight and it happened last week. For five months, six months, he's been battling against the cabinet office because what he wants to do is a process called maximization, whereby you are intent supposed to, as a chair, provide those who you are going to criticize with, and he's a very gentlemanly, terribly British way of saying about it. You know, this is what I'm going to say about you, is it all right? And would you like to also say it all And so, <laughs> anyway, this maximization process. He's saying, I can't do it, because I'm not allowed to disclose what he, Philcott, obviously has seen, and plainly what he's seen involves criticism. So he can't finish the job. Government says, well, if we can hang on to this, watch this space. I bet we're going to hang on to wriggle through the next election, because we've got enough other problems without having this on their place as well as everything else. So this is an extraordinary situation in which they're covering up you know, for one or more war criminals from the Iraq war, and there's nobody much now who believes anything other than the uh, dodgy dodgy, and I'm not going back to all over the argument to say many times. So there's all of that going on. And at the same time, we have a situation in which other war criminals, because that's essentially what was going on in relation to the Marines. Uh, I, I just, what I want to pause and just say, this, this is worthy of consideration in a sense, as part of all then maybe you have some I don't know, forgive me if you have. What is this about a quick start? That person. We should be thinking, why are we tolerating it? If the police, while well, I'm doing places in there at the moment, they're, well, you know, they're police, 
he realized quite sensibly, and he's done the right thing since, quite sensibly he's just putting it on. There was no way of answering this argument. And he gave a commitment on that day, which actually locked them into the position in Ireland. He said to them, and he then went back to the Labour government, and he then was, there is no way these nice these families, the whole of Liverpool, are not entitled at least to the documentation they say they've never seen, which would reveal the truth. And, you know, they're prepared to go wherever the documentation leads. That led to the establishment of an independent panel of inquiry, led not by a judge, interestingly, uh, not that I'm a great Christian of the Church of England, but on the other hand, the Bishop of Liverpool shares it, as a panel of people, a writer uh, again, uh, another academic, some archivists, all came onto this, who had specialties that they could contribute to um, investigating 400,000 documents that they managed to receive, which is the tip of the iceberg. 400,000 documents. And they did an amazing job because they sat down behind those doors and they said, I'm not, we're not telling anybody what we're doing. No leads to the press. Very interesting. No, the press didn't get hold of what they were going to say. Which means that when on September the 12th last year, <coughs> they found that I was in Liverpool at the time, said to the receiver, but I didn't know what's going to do. I didn't know what's going to do. And, you know, as you guys, a bit sanguine as to whether it's going to really say very much that it hasn't been said before. Obviously. Bishop organises it extremely well in the big cathedral there, so the press are locked over there, the lawyers are locked over here, the families have the main aisle as well. And out front of the report, and of course the report is occasionally in the course of front, so I can't go further than that, because new requests have been ordered, and they're happening next spring, and well, we'll go on and see what else happens from that. But the reason I, I isolate that is that demonstrates you know, and the power that ordinary people had at the end of the day. Uh, they had the moral high ground. Cameron had no choice. He had to stand up and say, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, you can have the better time. In the first place, and in the second place, once the re result came out, he said, yes, yes. Um, you know, truth first, justice follows truth. Very interesting to say that. It's exactly what previous um, story that MP said in Israeli said in um, 1870 or whatever, one of the debates I looked up, the phrase that they called <laughs> so it, and it's now on the Liverpool football website, um, that justice follows truth, you can't have one without the other. And, and interestingly, they're, they're locked into it. So in other words, it's people locking government, locking authorities into a situation from which they cannot escape. But it needs solidarity, once again. in all these cases, solidarity. And one, something that's happening next week, it comes back to Phil, uh, well, I would have said it, Phil had been here, is that, I think it was in the Times this morning, it's not in the Guardian, uh, or any other paper I've looked at during the day and the few minutes I've had. The Gibson Report is coming out next week. <coughs> now, the Gibson Report was in, <coughs> in private, basically, in secret, and a lot of what well, I think Phil included, refused, refused to participate because of the way it was being conducted. However, what is interesting, if the leak is correct, is that the report is going to concede, so I hope, um, Jack Straw, yet again, it is really in the It's going to concede that there has been, and there has been collusion by the security services in malpractice in Afghanistan, Iraq and elsewhere, and of course, it's going to be it's just all the same thing. Is that a song you say? You know, I no, no, I know nothing. Spanish racist stuff. That's what he was doing. And now they're gradually recognizing that it has been happening, of course it's been happening, that the British involvement. And perhaps nobody in this audience needs to be persuaded about that. However, that's stage one of the inquiry. What they're saying is there needs now to be a further investigation to what extent the British government ministers and officials know about it. And the reason that Chilcott got off the ground and the reason that this got off the ground, same thing, families saying, in the case of, of, of Chilcott, it was 
primarily military kind of thing, we want answers to what's going on out there. And in the, in, in, in the Gibson inquiry, much the same sort of thing. Family saying, we want this. If otherwise, they don't do it. So I'm saying back to September. I'm saying to the, the, the lawyers, the young lawyers in September, there are a massive opportunity for you to participate in doing things. Now, do tell me when you tell me um, I just wanted to say there's something that uh, I can't remember again that I told the lawyers in September. But today you have a little report defending human rights defenders brought by all day. Now, I remember this, and I don't know how many of you here were there, as it were, on the day. This is, this is another area I did speak about to the young man. Something that I've wanted to do, or tried to do, and I'm, I'm not doing it on my own, I'm doing it with other people, is lawyers without borders, like Medicine Sans Frontières. There is a big need for people to be able, at a moment's notice, to go to theatres of war, to go to theatres of Ackerman and of hostility in order to give support and give advice and do observe. Now I know Bill that does this kind of thing. At the moment it's quite different, it's different organisations. The one I'm particularly connected to is the Peace Brigade, started in Canada, I don't know whether you know about their work, but they've got a Peace Brigade Alliance list, which is a list of lawyers in the United Kingdom throughout the world, prepared to drop everything in a moment so it's a shadow civil rights defenders in South America where they said they were to Africa who were under threat. Now, I became involved in this because somebody I knew, you know, many, 30, 30, 40 years ago, as, um, as a neighbor virtually, and her sister had been sent to the So she wrote to me from South America, out of the blue, you know, she's kind of my age, so you can see you know, it's getting on with it. And I thought, well, South America, she said, I need your help. And then she wrote that. And she wasn't doing it at that stage. And she, she dropped everything. She sold up. She decided she wanted to go to South America as a civil rights defender. Because the scheme was that if um, a civil rights defender, somebody who's defending the workers against the corporation decimating the forest, let's say in South America, you know, the government had no compunction other than shooting dead. They're sending the bulldozers or whatever. They're not worried about it. They are worried with international observers about And the death rate among civil rights workers in South America has dropped dramatically with the presence of shadow, basically. And I thought that was such a marvelous thing that she did, and is still doing, to give up basically what could have been a sort of vaguely comfortable life or in North London, in fact. But she goes to South America, she's now in Africa. So I say to the younger lawyers, I'm not expecting you to go straight out onto the front line and, you know, be shot tomorrow. On the other hand, you know, there is a job to be done to support this. And I addressed the conference in, in Oxford in February, a Lawyers Without Borders conference, 200 lawyers there, young lawyers. And the response to that was enormous. In other words, there were lawyers prepared to help establish networks to ensure that there are people, to be, uh, we're all engaged in different things, we're trying to find somebody who's available tomorrow, trying to find the funds to get them out there, having the network on the ground to receive them, making sure you go in pairs, you can't possibly go on your own, and there are all sorts of risks of that, to getting people educated. Well that, in a sense, is this conference that all going organised in conjunction with Amnesty at the Amnesty building. And you'll see when you get the report at the back, a number of different countries, who were so gratified to be able, once again, the ones who are allowed to get here, whether it's Palestine, Belarus, Colombia, they're all here, Chechnya. And the good thing about the day was it brought them all into one place, it brought them, you know, the cross fertilization of ideas, they could see the solidarity, they could see, in other words, they're not acting alone, they had this back up here and that people really care. It's just like, you know, people with green tea factories locked up in Russia need to know that there are people out there willing to make the contact and willing to take action, that's, that's the real thing. And so it, it, it may have taken a little time to produce the report, but actually on the day, it produced a lot of solidarity for the people who were involved in it. And there is a section here, I was looking to see future work and next steps, chapter four. Well, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of good ideas in there, but one of the ideas I'd like to move tonight is linked to legal observance is that it's extremely important to form a coalition of people willing to 
stretch over borders to do the kind of work, as I said, that medicine is contracting over. And it doesn't mean you have to be on the front line. There's lots of other work that can be done, especially electronic uh, working, which is sort of what's going to do in the new thing. Electronic working is extremely important for texting, getting messages out, getting communication, organisation. Of course, prison are looking at it. And of course, you know, the British government is doing the same, but it's a two-way process. You can always be one step ahead of what is going on. So that, that would be, and that was an important part of what we tried to do with legal observing in this country. Now what I did do, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear, I hope they are still doing it even if it's for the small demonstration, because it's a big threat for the bigger demonstration. Uh, and what we set up, I think I thought about it, law, legal observancy, some years ago now, and it was during the print dispute, it was ensuring that we had, at Wokham, at Wokham. And the idea was to have official observers there with yellow jackets going in pairs. One does the observing, the other does the noting or the recording on the camera or whatever, so that you could be available for obviously malpractice and watching what's going on. Now they were obviously troubled by that. But what's happening now is they're not no longer troubled so much. So the, 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 the challenge here is much as it is in foreign arenas. They're arresting the observers. They're arresting the observers for all sorts of offences of, you know, public order and all the rest of it. That the justice they are for demonstration. However, I want to emphasise how important it is. As you may or may not know, an Alpha Meadows case was part of the meeting in September uh, because he started the right to protest. You all know about that, I'm sure. And that was supposed to be part of the coalition agreement. They were going to restore the right to people to protest and all the other level. However, you all know what happened to Alfred Meadows. And what I was slightly disappointed about, it's not the result, it's probably at the end of the day, but it took a lot of effort to get there. Uh, there were three times before we got the, the result. And a combination of lawyers, it wasn't just me, a number, number of others, listed and other barristers. So it was a team work effort. On the day of that massive demonstration through central London to Parliament Square, Kettles and corrals and all those ways you know about, and the really quite horrific violence was being used by police at the end of the day, which led eventually to a uh, sudden injury to Alfie's head. Was it they were legal as the other? But where were they when it mattered? And unfortunately, and I don't want to be hypercritical because it, you know, these are very frightening events. But if you're there in the middle of it, and if you want to see how frightening they are, it hasn't been brought up very much, but we managed to get into, I think, all of the time. There are remarkable aerial photographs of what the police did at the end of the protest, the major one, on the day of the vote. They heard it, something like 3,000, 4,000 of the protesters at 11 o'clock at night, November, freezing, well, we're in November now, it's beginning to get chilled, onto Westminster Bridge, and they kept them there for over an hour and a half, on the bridge. So tight, people were nearly suffocated to death. We had video at ground level, showing people screaming, and the answer that the officer gave when he said, well, people could have fallen over because it, it only comes up to the wayside, into the river, and he said, yeah, yeah, well, we've got a boat. <laughs> so that's the level that what would have helped, massively would have helped, was the legal observers who were there had stayed there and had provided statements to back up. As it was, we had to crawl through hours and hours of CCTV to work out a general picture of what had happened. Whereas if there'd been someone on the ground who could have provided the overall picture as an independent observer, it would have made a huge difference. Now this the whole idea of legal observing, I'm going to end on this note, you may think that's a little off, um, is, is Aubrey. Now, uh, and I know Mike again knows a lot about Aubrey. Aubrey's back in the news. Why is it back in the news? Because it's the same police force that were dealing with Hillsborough. I mean, they came in 1984, and Hillsborough was 1989. But it's South Yorkshire, yet again. Now, important of all groups, important of all groups, is there is now a truth and justice campaign that started for all groups. Because they, they may have all been.